So thanks for uh, sitting down for the interview. Um, what's your name and what are you currently working on? My name is Lee Byron. I work at Facebook on the product infrastructure team. So I work on React, GraphQL, and Immutable JS primarily, amongst a handful of other things. So um, how long have you been involved with React? Uh, pretty much since the beginning. So you can you can um, blame to me the original API for um, the component lifecycle methods. Uh, I think that was my first major contribution to React. And so I've been participating in its development since then. Very cool. Um, what was your talk on today? Uh, today I talked about uh, GraphQL. And so we explored what it is and why it's valuable. Um, and then we got to open source a couple major pieces of GraphQL today, which was exciting. So uh, maybe you could expand on that a little bit. So what does GraphQL mean to the majority of, say, uh, web developers working with modern JavaScript today? So GraphQL um, exists outside of the JavaScript world um, and describes what a web server is capable of doing and then lets clients describe what kind of information that they want from those servers. Um, and it's the way that we build all of our applications, not just JavaScript applications, but native applications, iOS apps, Android apps. Um, it actually started as how we deliver data to our first native iOS app three years ago. And so it's expanded since then. So the thing that we've open sourced now is uh, a specification document that describes what it is and how it works that people can refer to if they're trying to build GraphQL themselves, but also a um, version of JavaScript, or sorry, a version of GraphQL that's implemented in JavaScript designed to be used for Node.js, uh, but you can also use to build client tools. So I'll probably date myself a little bit and uh, apologize ahead of time, but how does this compare to RDF and the semantic web? And uh, if there's a, a short answer to that. Um, there's not really a short answer. I could, I could probably... Uh, go down a rabbit hole with that one, but um, we're kind of taking a left turn at Albuquerque with, with that. So the RESTful API uh, design and a lot of things that have come from that have built upon the semantic web and um, having servers that can describe their APIs in ways that are easily consumed by each other. So GraphQL is a little bit different from that. Um, instead of that being our primary goal of the semantic web, our primary goal is the concise description of the capabilities of a single server. And that's important for the kinds of things that we're building today and applications so that um, individual iOS or Android applications can uh, decouple themselves from the server that they use to provide a lot of the information they need to work. So would this be like a WSDL for REST? Uh, hopefully that there's like similar ideas there, hopefully way simpler than that. But yes, similar ideas. Yeah, uh, hopefully better. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thanks. I just wanted to ask a few of those questions to clarify for people who aren't familiar with GraphQL. So um, what do you see in the future of JavaScript and React over the next couple of years? Um, I think that's going to be really exciting. So React, I think, has been um, a bridge between these two worlds of the kind of ideological functional programmers um, and the practical object-oriented programmers who are always looking for the you know, fastest way to get their job done. And React is this kind of interesting bridge between the two where for the first time, a lot of the practical programmers are finding out that the more idealistic functional programming tools are actually practical for what they want to do. And the things that functional programmers have known for decades um, are now being kind of put in the minds of these like practical day-to-day -day hacker types that are trying to actually build things to get stuff done. But at the same time, it's brought a lot of the world of the object-oriented programming um, world, including primarily UI development, into the functional programming world. So up until now, the solutions for doing UIs in functional languages have also been a little bit lacking. And React is kind of the first time that we've built something that is a bridge between these worlds in, in both directions. So functional programmers can write the same code that they like to write and interface with this very imperative system of the DOM or uh, UI views on iOS, uh, et cetera. Um, and then imperative programmers can interface with this thing and kind of treat it imperatively at first, but start to learn a lot of the functional ideas. So we've been speaking about this a lot with a lot of the influ influencers of the JavaScript language and are starting to push on these ideas that come from functional programming, whether that's 
you know, just the higher order functions that we've actually had since ES5, map, filter, and reduce, building upon those, um, or adding immutable values to JavaScript, I think is going to be really exciting. That offers a lot of opportunities. The functional programming world has known for a long time the benefits of these, but sometimes they're lost on um, imperative object-oriented programmers. And I think we're starting to see those walls break down a bit and starting to share techniques. And I really look forward to JavaScript becoming a little bit more functional as time goes on. And I think um, we can maybe blame React for some of that. Um, that would be awesome if that works out. Thanks for that. So uh, that's all the questions I had. So thank you very much.